Hey everyone, my name is Richard Rowland. You probably know me from the Amon Sewell podcast or from uh, Universal History with Jonathan Pajot. Today, I want to talk to you about something weird and personal and even a little uncomfortable. I have written a book. It's not a normal book. It's not a very long book. It's not a novel. It's not a piece of nonfiction. It's... <sighs> It's sort of a window into a much larger world, and I will just say, it is not for everyone. Since I was about 12 years old, I've had my own private country, what Tolkien called a secret vice. This itself is not a huge deal. Most people do something like this, and most people grow out of it eventually. I did not. Rather, in a lot of important ways, you could say that I grew into it. Have you ever had a project that just wouldn't leave you alone? That's this for me. So for the last 20 plus years, there hasn't been a single day that's passed that I haven't thought about, written about, pondered about, a place that is as close to my heart as your favorite secondary worlds are to you, and maybe closer. This place is called The World Under Starlight, and for the last 20 years, the poetry and prose and bad novels that I've written to try to give it form concern a people known as the Amborai, the children of water and starlight. Now, there are no dwarves or elves here. Um, although my debt to Tolkien cannot be denied, my own imagination actually tends to run for inspiration to the uh, Hellenic and Iranian cultures that cl clustered around the Black Sea during antiquity. And this has been the case at least ever since I read Xenophon's Anabasis as a small boy. So this project has a lot of different components for me, and there are actually some parts of it that I still wouldn't feel comfortable telling most people about. Probably the easiest way to describe it, though, would be to frame it as an experiment. It was a way for a young man who did not feel like he belonged to any particular culture of his own to answer the question, what is it that makes a culture? What is it that holds a group of people together and makes them cohere as a body? Trying to answer that question for myself has led me down several interesting avenues over the years. It's how I got interested in things like linguistics and philology and universal history. Um, it's how I got interested in uh, historical Christianity and in liturgy. All of those things make this project what it is. It has language families, it has national epics, it has history and myth. Even, even It even has its own liturgical cycle. And as a rule, I do not share it with people. Um, I was a sort of like a chronic oversharer as a young boy. I know that's difficult for some of you to imagine. Um, and what I realized very early on is that people don't really want to hear about your imaginary friends, right? <laughs> they don't want to hear about this world that exists in your mind. Um, most people are, are just not interested in that. Um, and so I learned to sort of keep it to myself. Um, and, um, as a result, over the years, I've become very prickly about this stuff because it's so deeply personal to me that showing it to someone else is like bearing my soul to them. So over the years, I've only shared it with a small circle of very close friends. But it's hard to get people to read poetry, uh, especially long poetry about a world they've never been to, uh, which is actually what most of this is. So I eventually started running a tabletop campaign set in the world as a sort of a sneaky way to a sneaky way to share the thing that's really the most important to me, which is literature, uh, with my friends. Then about a year ago, I met a guy named Christopher Tompkins. Christopher is the owner of Darkly Bright Press, who's publishing this book. Um, there'll be a link to their catalog below. And Darkly Bright Press specializes in publishing small curiosities, literary ephemera, uh, both new works and also works lost to time uh, that Christopher sort of finds and he digs up and he's got a real nose for digging these things up and republishing them. And somehow, he and I got to talking. And somehow, I still do not know how this happened. He was so kind and so quiet that I just ended up volunteering stuff. Which is, anyone who knows me will tell you is pretty uncharacteristic. Um, and so we wanted to start with a small project to gauge interest and also just introduce people to the larger world. And so Christopher suggested a small book. It's really more of a booklet, which would introduce some of that flavor of the world to people, but wouldn't necessarily be, um, like, let's say, uh, you know, it's not a phone book uh, uh, sized 
no one knows what a phone book is anymore. But it's not a you know it's not a door stopper. Um, uh, and so after some discussion and going back and forth, we settled on three pieces that we thought would make a very nice introduction for a certain kind of person. Again, this book is not for everyone. This book is barely for anybody other than me, but I think that there might be a few people out there who would appreciate something like this. Because see, what there isn't is any kind of equivalent to like The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit uh, here. I mean, there are novels, but they're very bad. And I know they're bad. I know you can't read them. Um, no one is allowed to read them. Uh, but, but for me, the real joy, the juice, if you will, of a project like this has always been not in the writing of a novel, but in the creation of a whole oral textual tradition. What do I mean by that? The earliest way to explain it, or sorry, the easiest way to explain it is that everything that is written in the English language is to some degree in a conversation with, let's say, everything else that's written in English. Really not everything else, but let's say a few key texts. And actually these texts themselves extend beyond things originally composed in English to include the great works of what is sometimes called the Western canon. You can think of things like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Bible, uh, the whole Arthuriana, uh, the Aeneid, Shakespeare, and so on. And so when people talk or write or make movies or tell stories, etc., they're drawing on this well from what Tolkien calls the cauldron of story, so that our stories are littered with what you might call hyperlinks. Um, and so the way this works is if you know the older work that's being referenced or quoted, it enhances and enriches your enjoyment of the new work. A great example of this on a popular level is uh, basically almost any Star Trek show, uh, especially The Next Generation. Uh, well, I mean, the, the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. Um, they, uh, and, and then a lot of those early Star Trek films as well, I mean, they, they draw not just on tropes, but they, they actually draw whole plot elements from Shakespeare's plays and from works of classical and, you know, uh, Greek and Roman mythology and so on. So if you know the older work that's being referenced or quoted, it enhances and it enriches your enjoyment of the new work. But then if you dig, you know, let's say you sort of follow that hyperlink, you dig back and it turns out that older work is also hyperlinked to a bunch of things that might be older than it and so on, right all the way back to the very first story, which according to philologists is something like hero slays serpent. I mean, it's the most perfect story. Like, what, what more do you need? And so what all of this means is that the more you study stories, the more all of them mean. You become immersed, not just in one culture, but in many cultures, and you become enriched as a result. Uh, C.S. Lewis called this seeing with many eyes. So usually, fantasy and sci-fi authors try to create this effect for a world artificially by creating a reference to another work, a legend, or a text, or a song that doesn't actually exist anywhere except for that reference. A good example of this is Frank Herbert's Dune novel. So the heading of each chapter in Frank Herbert's Dune begins with a short epigraph taken from a work of history written by the Princess Irulan. But these books written by the Princess Irulan do not exist anywhere except in those references. It's a neat trick. Uh, it's a kind of a sleight of hand that makes the world feel like it's got depth and history and tradition to it. A kind of window dressing that serves the more important purposes of the story, which is the novel that Herbert's actually trying to write. It makes sense, right? If, if uh, he wants to command, uh, convey the sense of dimensionality, of depth and breadth to his writers, uh, or rather to his readers. But if you really made himself write the entire text of the Manual of Muad'Dib and Muad'Dib, the Family Commentaries, and a Child's History of Muad'Dib, and the Dictionary of Muad'Dib, and Analysis, the Arakim Crisis, which is only written for Bene Gesserit circulation, uh, the Humanity of Muad'Dib, the History of the Butlerian Jihad, the Collected Sayings of Muad'Dib, In My Father's House, the Songs of Muad'Dib, Conversations with Muad'Dib, Arrakis Awakening, and so on, because there's a lot of them. If he were to just try to write all of the text of every single one of those things out before he wrote Dune, he would never have finished Dune, right? Well, I'm kind of weird. I would actually rather read all of those books that exist in the Dune universe, but which I can't read, than to read the novel Dune, partly because I'm more interested to know 
what people who live in the world of Dune have to say about it, how they think, how they experience the world, than I am in what Frank Herbert has to say about it. Never mind that he's the creator of the world. I want to I want to get sort of the inside perspective. Well, all of this is a roundabout way of describing my project, which is basically this. What if every text that was referenced by every other text really existed? In short, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And it means that in a way, there's no good place to start. But on the other hand, anywhere is a good place to start. So with that said, we picked three pieces for this book, the Akborida, which we felt would give a taste of the world under starlight. So the early days of the Amborian nation um, is the first piece in here. It's the longest piece in here. And it's just a short prose history of the mythical, let's say, days before the days of recorded history. It tells how the Amborai, the children of water and starlight, came to be. Um, there's also a piece in here called the Songs of the Seven Cities, and this is seven short poems. They're actually Spencerian sonnets for those of you who are uh, following along at home. Um, but they describe a series of seven visions or dreams of that prehistorical civilization. And then finally, there are the two hymns of forging, which is which are excerpted from uh, the much larger extant collection of Amborian liturgical hymns, uh, which is a pretty large collection. In fact, right here I have my my editing copy of the first volume of the Book of Odes. There are five of these. So this is about a little less than 25%, and it's uh, 265 pages. So there's a lot of liturgical hymns in the cycle. And um, maybe someday some of those will also be able to come to light. Um, but the two hymns of forging are two very important liturgical hymns. I thought they'd be like a good a good introduction to that particular uh, flavor, that particular part of this project. And so in closing, let me say something about the physical book itself. First of all, it is not long. It is only about 60 pages. Uh, Darkly Bright Press is the only place that you can buy these stories for now, and there will only be 50 copies. So there are going to be 20 signed hardcover copies like this one, and then 30 paperbacks like this guy. Um, some people on social media have been a little agitated about this. It's actually kind of surprised me. Um, because I, I, I sort of doubt there are really 50 people in the world who are that interested in this, but I, I think it's cool if, if there are. Um, you know, so one of the questions people have asked is, hey, why do, do you know about print-on-demand? Have you ever heard of that? Why wouldn't you just print as many copies as possible, right? Or use print-on-demand services to make sure the supply never runs out and so on and so forth. The easiest way to answer this question is simply this. In a world where it feels like we can make as much as we want of anything, Everything, even simple pieces of crockery that in some other society would have taken as many hours to fashion and uh, would have been passed down as priceless heirlooms, have become disposable, replaceable, and forgettable. Darkly Bright Press specializes in the small, out-of-the-way, hidden, forgotten... It's okay to write a book and sell a million copies, don't get me wrong, but it's also okay to make something that is small, and just for the people who will love it. And like I said, there's a little part of me, uh, that part of me that's like shy and awkward and nervous about this, that is skeptical that there are really 50 whole people out there who will genuinely enjoy this sort of thing. But if you're one of them, and you would like to see more, I hope that you will let me and Darkly Bright Press know, and maybe you'll see more collaborations down the road. Um, so there'll be a link below to Darkly Bright Press's catalog. The book will be officially for sale sometime in August, probably early August, I would guess. Um, and if this is your cup of tea, I hope that you'll buy a copy. I hope you'll tell people about it. And um, I hope you'll let us know if you like it. And if you do, then maybe you'll see more of this kind of thing. Um, that's it for now. This has been Richard Rowland, signing out. <laughs>